If you have your Bibles with you, I hope you do, you'll turn to Esther chapter 4. I'm not good at remembering quotes, but there are a couple that have stuck with me. I don't remember where or when I first heard or read this one, but it's, you maybe even have heard me say that life wouldn't be so hard if it weren't so daily. That one's always stuck with me. The second one, I was kind of late to the game. It seemed like everyone knew this one but me, but I didn't hear it until my son Matthew graduated from artillery training in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and the lieutenant colonel kind of giving the address opened with saying, life is hard, it's harder when you're stupid, right? You've heard that one, right? <laughs> so those two quotes have always stuck with me about life and, and, and kind of living, it seems to me that, that one way of looking at life is that it is just a series of nonstop moments. You just, you just put all these moments together and it's a day in your life, a, a season in your life, right? Some are happy, some are sad, some are exciting, some are boring. In the course of the day, you go through all these. Some are frustrating, like when you sit down on your cup of water in church and get water all over your notes, sermon notes, your Bible, and your backside. Other moments in life are surprising. They're, they're unexpected. They're even shocking. That's the case for Mordecai in chapter 3 of Esther. In his act of resistance, in bowing down to the king's right-hand man, a man named Haman, everything takes a very dramatic turn. In one moment, life goes from zero to 60 in like 2.3 seconds. Haman plots to have Mordecai put to death for his lack of respect, but as you recall, not just Mordecai, but Mordecai's people, the Jews, are intended to be destroyed. Haman then convinces Xerxes, and if you've been following, you know that that's not a hard thing to do, to issue a decree that on the 13th day of the 12th month, the Jews throughout the Persian Empire are to be killed, destroyed, and annihilated. And before you could say the citadel of Susa, the edict was sent out. And then the chapter ended with the, the citizens of Susa reading this edict, edict and themselves being bewildered. For Mordecai and the Jews, the moment they read the edict, they're devastated. It would be for them, it would be for all the Jews, what we call a defining moment. It's a term that gets used probably too much, like a lot of superlatives, but there are defining moments in life. They're not the common everyday moments of life. But you live life long enough and you will come face to face with what we call a defining moment. In the history of our nation, 244 some years, right? There really are not that many defining moments. July 4, 1776, the Declaration of Independence is finally written, edited, ratified. Well, it's not ratified till August 2nd. I don't know why we celebrate July 4. Someone can tell me that later. April 12, 1861, the first Shots fired on Fort Sumter, the beginning of the Civil War. December 7, 1941, Pearl Harbor is bombed. 9-11 of 01, a defining moment in our nation when the World Trade Centers were attacked. February 7, 2021, when the baton is passed to Patrick Mahomes as the greatest quarterback <laughs> in the NFL. When we look at our Bibles, we see a lot of important moments, but fewer of them are defining moments. Certainly the promise to Abraham and his leaving home for another land, a defining moment. The birth of Isaac when the promise is finally fulfilled. Certainly the exodus out of Egypt. Not to mention the defining moment, the cross and the empty tomb, right? Well, add to these... The 13th day of the first month, somewhere around the year 470 B.C., the day the edict was written to annihilate God's people. 
From our perspective, it, it, it could appear as though God's plan of salvation is in danger. Where's, the, where's Emmanuel going to come from if the people of God are destroyed? So let me offer, and, and, and to be honest, I've just kind of taken several attempts of people's def definition of a defining moment and kind of made this one uh, myself. So I'm going to define a defining moment this way, that it's a moment in time when a situation becomes nothing less than life changing and it reveals the true character of a person, a community, even a nation. It's such a time where nothing afterwards is the same. That's a defining moment. Now, a sermon on defining moments can go in a lot of directions. So let me just tell you first, it's not my intent this morning to help you kind of seize the day and conquer your defining moment. This is not a motivational speech to inspire you. It's a lesson intended to prepare you because we will all face defining moments where life will never be the same. And the true character within us will be revealed. And we don't need to go looking for them. They find us. They come to us. As they did for Mordecai and Esther. Chapter 4 of the book of Esther. Let's read it together. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done. He tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of the sackcloth, but he would not accept them. When Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. All that we looked at last week in chapter 3. He gave, he, Mordecai, gave this attendant, a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show Esther and to explain it to her. And he told her to instruct her to go to the king's presence, to beg for mercy, and to plead with him for her people. Key phrase we'll come to later. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. So there's this correspondence back between Hathak and Mordecai and Esther, don't think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but you have come to this royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, go. Gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. And when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Let's pray. Another example, God, of 
the peril of being your called out people. And we know the end. We know of your faithfulness. But in this moment, what fear and what, what devastation the Jews must have experienced. Who would they turn to? Who will we turn to in our defining moments? So God, I pray that you would open our eyes uh, this morning to see your true character, to receive your certain promises, and that our faith would be in you and you alone. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so if you look at the outline and it seems a little long, I promise we'll be out by kickoff, so don't worry there. But what I want to do this morning, I want to, just, I want to take two different views, and I've been using this metaphor throughout the series. I want to take the forest view first, get high above this scenario and take a look down at it before we get down onto the ground and look at it kind of from the tree perspective. So let's start by looking at, at what I'm going to offer is three, and I'm sure there are more, but at least three elements of defining moments, okay? And again, not just this defining moment, but ours as well. You, you may hear echoes of your own conversion in this perspective, in this view. Element number one of a defining moment is, this, is crisis, Seems to me that crisis lies at the heart of every defining moment, whether it's personal, communal, national, whatever it might be. In the, in the Christian community, we sometimes talk about, or you may have heard the phrase, you know, crisis of faith. A moment in time when we have to face what we truly believe in the midst of a severe trial and suffering. Some of the most extraordinary and heroic accomplishments emerge out of moments of crisis, don't they? We've, we've read about them in history books. We've, we hear about them on occasion in the news. On 9-11, a Welsh-born Vietnam vet named Rick Rescorla was the head of security of Morgan Stanley. And when the first plane hit the first tower... An announcement came over the intercom in the second tower for everyone to, to stay where they were and to remain calm. And he instinctively knew that was not the right strategy. So taking a bullhorn that he had, he began to get all of the Morgan Stanley employees down the stairs. Speaking encouraging words, calming words, even though it was a bullhorn, even at times singing old Welsh hymns. 2,700 Morgan Stanley employees made it to safety. Only six died, including Rick Rescorla. But you don't have to go looking for a crisis, do you? Again, they come to you. It's, it's, it's the death of someone close. And how do we respond? Illness, chronic conditions, threats to our security, our safety, they come to us. One day, Mordecai is going about his normal work in the gate of Susa, and the next moment he reads an edict that he, along with all the Jews, are to be killed, destroyed, annihilated, wiped out. One day Esther is living her life in the palace, presumably in, in some form of luxury, and when she hears about her adopted father, Mordecai, in the condition he's in and finds out why he's in that condition, it all changes. They're face to face with a crisis. The first element of a defining moment, followed by, I would offer, conviction. Because I think life crises challenge us to examine our heart and force us to confront what is it we really believe. Not just what do we believe about the crisis, but what do we believe in the crisis? It seems to me that crises expose what's on the inside of us. And so if crises are a part of God's providence, and we believe that they are, then trying to figure it all out, 
Oh, how do we uh, often do we do that? We try to come up with reasons for it. How all the details of the crisis fit together. And, and usually it only brings us more frustration, sometimes doubt, even at times erroneous conclusions. We are prone to just try to come up with a cause and effect to all the hardships that we face, the crisis that confronts us. This is happening to me because, you know, I, I did this a couple months ago. And, and then we try to just play God. And he's the only all-knowing one. We're not, but we think that we can fit it all together. As we said last week, in the immediacy of the moment, God's providence is seldom understandable to us. And when we try to put all the pieces together, it's not only unhelpful, it can be dangerous. So I know advice is cheap, but can I offer a little bit of advice? That the less we try to figure out what we don't know, the more we can focus on what we do know. Namely, the promises of God, the character of God. Seems to me the more we try to figure out a crisis, the more we become transfixed on the crisis, don't we? That's all we can then think about. When all you can see is Goliath, you forget about God. When all you can see are the enemies or the armies of the enemy, you forget about the armor that can protect you from the enemy. And so in the immediacy of the, of the moment, Mordecai has this one conviction God will deliver the Jews. He, he tells, through the messenger, he tells Esther, it may come from another place. And oh, commentators go to town on what he means by that. And we don't know specifically. Does he mean another person? Does he mean another army? Does he mean himself? We don't know. But his conviction is, if you don't stand up and, and face this moment together with all the Jews... Deliverance will come from another place. That's his conviction. There's still yet things yet to be accomplished in God's covenant, his promise, and his plan. And that conviction that God will bring deliverance from another place leads him to an insight. And I, I know I just said that in the immediacy of the moment, we seldom understand the providence of God, but sometimes we get a glimpse of it. Sometimes we catch it. Because just as a crisis can cloud our thinking, sometimes a crisis brings clarity to our thinking. And it's my opinion that, it, that Mordecai has a moment of clarity. When he says the most famous words in the book of Esther and some of the most famous in the entire Bible, who knows, but you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. It's conjecture, I suppose. Mordecai is not claiming divine knowledge, but it seems to me that it's, con it's conjecture based on conviction. God will deliver his people. And with conviction then, and only with these convictions, do we find courage to then actually face and walk through the crisis, which is what makes it then a defining moment. Now, courage is only courage, right, when what we're facing is a genuine threat. It, 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 really, it really takes no courage for me to stand up here and preach week after week. Ask me to go down the hall and teach the kindergartners. Courage would be needed for me to do that. But in order for a defining moment to make a difference in our lives, the crisis that invokes our conviction must be met with courage. Or you can just put the word, you know, faith. Active faith, real faith. The people of Israel, faced with Pharaoh's army bearing down on them and a, a sea that looked like the size of an ocean in front of them, though the waters are separating, it, they had to walk through. They had to exercise courage. Their faith had to be put into action. David, facing an intimidating giant, had a conviction that God was greater than Goliath. He still had to pick up the stones, didn't he? Same is true of Esther. 
Mordecai has a plan. Esther, I need you to go before the king and beg for mercy and plead with him for your people. Now they are her people. She, remember, he'd been telling Esther to, to hide her identity as a Jew. But now, go plead for your people. Now it presents a couple of challenges. The first is, as we just mentioned, Esther's identity as a Jew has been hidden. I, you know, I, presumably still to this day, though it's years after she's become queen. The second problem, of, as we read, was that Persian emperors had a law. If you approach the king without being invited, you could be put to death. Only if the king ex- extends his scepter would you be spared. And the problem is, as Esther conveys, it's been 30 days since I've seen the man's face. So you hear those four discouraging words, right? It's not that easy. Mordecai, what you're asking me to do is not that easy. But defining moments never are. So we have crisis, we have conviction, we have courage. So I think that, again, that's, that's kind of the forest level view of this. So let's bring it closer. Let's look at it from the tree level, so to speak. Let's understand something before an event becomes a defining moment. Again, we don't create defining moments. They come to us. But we can be prepared for them. It's, it's, it's Peter telling his audience, 1 Peter 4, 12, don't be surprised by the fiery trial that you're facing. Don't let it surprise you. You can be prepared. And our preparation for defining moments is what I would call a series of decisive moments. So before we get to a defining moment, life is filled with a series of decisive moments, which I would define this way. The numerous moments in time when circumstances test our faith in the true character of God, which make for life changing decisions. The numerous moments in time when circumstances test our faith in the true character of God, which make for life-changing decisions. You and I make decisions every day that can prepare us for the hardest days. Doesn't mean the hard days won't hurt. Doesn't mean we won't react as Mordecai did. (laughs) But we can still be prepared. Because they don't have to defeat us. Let me give you an example of this. Joshua had experienced a couple of defining moments in the history of Israel. He experienced the exodus from Egypt. And he experienced the crossing of the Jordan River at flood stage, raging river, into the promised land. So at the end of his life, Joshua then tries to prepare the people for any and all further defining moments that he knows they are sure to face. And so he challenges them with those words that are probably known to most of us. At the end of his life, Joshua, look at him with me, Joshua 24 and verse 14. Now, he tells the people, fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then you got to choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living. But as for me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. Do you hear this call to a decisive moment? Serve God with all faithfulness. Drive down a stake, Israel. Put down the marker here and now. Because this decisive moment will help you face a defining moment. And what it boiled down to for Israel and what it boils down to for you and me is the question of who or what is going to be at the center of your life. 
And Joshua recognizes there are other gods out there and lesser pursuits trying to get your attention and trying to get your devotion. Drive the stake down. Choose to serve God. The heart of Joshua's challenge then is the same for us today. Every day is a choice. Every day, every moment really of every day is a choice to serve God, to pursue God, to honor God. Those are, our, those are our, the options in front of us. Or if not, then what are we going to pursue? Who are we going to serve? And what are we going to honor? And so when we do those things in, in, in what I would call just the mundane, the mundaneness of, my, of life, they're doing a work of preparing us for the defining moments of life. I think we see these decisive moments again in Esther and Mordecai's story. Let's, let's notice again at least three of them. Three elements of decisive moments. The first being worshiping God. This is about as elemental as it gets. Now, Mordecai's immediate response to all that had been done is not to be confused with an overly dramatic pity party or a panic attack. Tearing one's clothes and putting on sackcloth was a familiar practice. When Jacob's sons came back and told him that Joseph was dead, of course they were lying, they sold him into slavery, but they told their father Jacob that Joseph was dead. Joseph or Jacob tears his clothes in anguish and grief. When David heard about the death of Saul, he tears his clothes because the Lord's anointed had been killed. Historians even tell us that Persians made this. When the, when, the, when the Persian armies lost to Greece, the people in Persia tore their clothes. So it's an obvious expression of deep grief and anguish. But, but it's my conviction, in my opinion, that for Mordecai and the Jews, their grief doesn't end there. In other words, their response doesn't end just with despondence. We're told that when the edict went throughout the provinces, that there was great mourning, verse 3, with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Now, to be sure, that's an emotional response. But I also think that it's, 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 it's a form of a spiritual response. That's a, a form of worship. You can find those three words fasting, weeping, wailing, individually throughout the, the Old Testament. Only one other place are they found together precisely as it's written here in Esther chapter 4. So let's do a, a, a bit of a study here. If you have your Bibles, I need you to keep your finger or your marker in Esther 4 and turn to Joel chapter 2. And I'm going to give you some time to find Joel. All right? And if you have... A phone, use your Bible. I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you go back and forth. So just bring a Bible next time, right? Uh, that's such an old man comment. Um, so let me get to Joel with you. We're going to draw our attention here because in light of Esther 4, it's likely that Joel's words would have been known to Mordecai, Esther, and, and their contemporaries. He's a, he's a post-exile prophet. So, in other words, just a few generations perhaps, maybe even less, than the lives of Mordecai and Esther. And his words are what one commentator called, and it seemed to just resonate with me, and I, I find the truth in it, that, that his words, of Joel, that Joel's words are like an echo that we hear when we go to Esther 4. So we need to hear the original so that we can hear the echo, the original in Joel 2, so we hear the echo of it in Esther 4. Does that make sense, Bill, what I just said? Thank you. I mean that. If that doesn't make sense, let's call a timeout. Here's what we read in Joel chapter 2, verse 12. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart with fasting and weeping and mourning. That's the exact same word as wailing in Esther 4 in the original language. So there's our phrase. Return to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. That's precisely what's happening in Esther 4. And 
If that's, if that's a, an echo from Joel 2, then it, it seems like it has, there's overtones of worship involved here. Joel continues, chapter 2, verse 13, rend your heart and not your garments. Not that tearing one's clothes wasn't a proper expression of grief, but that one's grief should not be contained to your wardrobe. And it must include your heart. Worship. Joel's word from God was for the people to turn to God in their distress. Their emotional response was to be a deeply worshipful response. So he goes on in chapter 2 and verse 13. Return to the Lord your God for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. So in the midst of this crisis actually lies an opportunity for spiritual revival. And there's no better time for revival or returning to God than an edict that calls for your annihilation. Fasting, which includes prayer, weeping, and wailing are all expressions, I think, of worship, a call to return to God, to place Him in the center. And by the way, I think it's interesting that Esther, upon hearing these, this news, her response is, well, it, let's call a three-day fast. Let's worship. Let's seek God. I think the brilliance of this is that the edict, as horrifying as it was, could then be seen in its proper perspective. For without the fasting, without the weeping and the wailing, the edict is just doomsday. But when you see it as a response to trigger you back to putting God at the center in worship, you see it in a little different perspective. I, have you ever heard, and uh, if you've said this, don't worry, I've said it too. So we're all in the same plate field. Sometimes we say, come into worship and, and forget about all the, the worries out there in the world. Put all that aside and come in and worship. And it seems to me that's a, that's a disservice to worship. Because in worship, we see all that stuff on the outside in its proper context. We gain a clearer perspective of all that stuff that's going out. Bring it with you and lay it before God and worship God in, in relation to all that stuff. Because worship, folks, is not, worship is not unrelated to life. Worship prepares us for life. And I would contend, especially for the defining moments in life. It is a decisive moment that you made this morning to be here. And, and, and it didn't seem dramatic to you at the time, or maybe it did, I don't know. But you made a decision to be here. And you will make a decision tomorrow of what and who to pursue. And whether to worship God or whether to ignore God. And all these decisive moments lead to handling a defining moment. With faith. How's your worship? Whether it's a corporate gathering like this, whether it's personal devotions, whether it's active service, worship centers us on God so that what comes next honors Him. Decisive moment number one, worshiping God. Number two, knowing God. An intentional, purposeful pursuit of knowing God. Because worship changes us when we know the one whom we worship. And so Joel, speaking for God, is saying in effect, in your fasting and your weeping and your wailing, focus on the nature and the character of God. That he is full of grace and compassion, abounding in love, slow to anger, will relent from sending calamity that we deserve, these, don't tell me there's not grace in the Old Testament. And then this in Joel 2.14, another echo that we hear in Esther 4. Who knows, Joel asks, who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing. Grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. 
Mordecai asked Esther, who knows? But you're in the position you're in for such a time as this. And we might actually receive a blessing from God in the midst of this calamity. In other words, Haman doesn't have the last word. His edict is not the last word. In a moment of clarity, I think Mordecai sees the providence of God in the moment. And if it's true that the words of Joel are echoing in the hearts of Mordecai and Esther, then they would also know these words. We'd, let's just finish, or, 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 or not finish the chapter, but another section. Chapter 2 of Joel, verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly. Gather the people, consecrate the assembly, bring together the elders, gather the children, those nursing at the breast, let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber, let the priest who minister before the Lord weep between the portico and the altar, let them say, spare your people, Lord, do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations, why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? I... I'm not scholar enough to know. Did, did Joel really have, did God have this moment in Esther 4 in mind with this? I, is it another day? You can read. You can come up with your own decision. But doesn't it, doesn't it apply here? I don't think Mordecai's message to Esther, in other words, then, was like a locker room speech. You got to get in there. You got to fight. There's the promise of the Messiah yet to be fulfilled. There's the promise of a new covenant. Now, and all this is, is at stake in this crisis, this defining moment. And so knowing this, Esther 4, verse 14, is not empty hype. I think it is confidence in God. Which leads to a third element of decisive moments, identifying with God. To be sure, this crisis will bring a defining moment to Esther. We'll see this next week. To save her people will mean revealing her own identity. So in this moment, Esther has to decide who she really is. That's what defining moments do. With her. We have to decide who we really are and what we really believe. We've pointed out before that in the book of Esther, she's the only person who has two names. Her Hebrew name, Hadassah, but we know her better by her Persian name, Esther. And in one shocking moment, she learns about all that happened, and the man who raised her is asking her, risk your life for your people, and your silence won't save you. I admit... This message from Mordecai to Esther is perplexing. It sounds like he's threatening her. It, it, it's, it, it's, it's hard. But I think, he's, I think he's just laying it out there. This is the truth of the matter, Esther. If, if, if deliverance comes from you, it'll come from somewhere else. And, but just don't think that your silence is going to save you. Don't think that inactivity is the solution. The decision she faces will permanently define her future and determine the destiny of her people. And that's reached. That decision we, we read. All right. Gather the people of Jew, the Jews in Susa together. Let's fast for three days. I'll do the same. And I will go to the king. And if I die, I die. So in this moment, being liberator of her people became more important to Esther than being the queen of Persia. And it makes me wonder, what am I holding on to that I think is so important that I won't or wouldn't clearly identify myself with God? What do I think I have to hold on to? Well, I can't tell you the circumstances of a defining moment in your life or in the life even of this church. I do believe they come and how we prepare for them says everything about how we will meet the moment. But God, through the revelation in his word, has given us every reason to believe 
that he will use our crisis for his glory and our good. The resurrection proves that. The book of Acts reveals that. What he has done before, he will do again. So I'd like to tie a nice little red bow on your defining moment so we could all walk away fully confident and courageous, but it's not that easy. So what I encourage you to do is to never stop pursuing God, inviting Him into your crisis rather than thinking He's absent in your crisis. And who knows, but that you are where you are for such a time as this. Let's pray. Father, it is the temptation in difficulty to focus on the difficulty. To lower our vision from things above where you are seated to the mess that we're in. And when we do that, God, it is so easy to become discouraged, defeated. And so, would we take this lesson from these two who are facing what looks like certain death, not just for them, but for all your people, and choose instead, God, to worship you, to confess our identity in you, to pursue our knowledge of you, So that when the defining moment comes, you are glorified. And somehow, someway, you work it for our good in all these things. We believe that. We trust you with that. May we live that is our prayer in Christ's name.